So previously we talked about Lewis dot structures in VSEPR to figure out connectivity as well as structure. And so now we're going to dive into the second half of ch chapter 7.6. And we're going to talk about electronegativity and polarity. And so there's the learning outcomes and expectations. Feel free to pause and read through those, but we're going to dive right in. And so 7.6 of the book. And so we, in the previous lecture, we talked about taking molecular formula, turning that into a Lewis dot structure or connectivity, and then taking the electron clouds and determining the structure using VSEPR, valence shell electron pair repulsion, to get a 3D structure. And one of the main reasons we want to do that, at least in terms of general chemistry too, is we want to know about something called polarity. And so when we look at our Lewis dot structure, we draw a bond between two hydrogen atoms. We draw two electrons, or we draw a line here, um, those two hydrogen sharing electron. The reality of this, beyond just drawing them on the page, is that these are electron clouds, right? And you learn about molecular orbitals and things like that, uh, but there's clouds shared between those atoms. And so when you look at something like HF, it's also sharing them. And so the drawing here looks exactly the same, but the chemical reality is you're going to have an electron poor region and an electron rich region. And so that's what this electron cloud is depicting here. It basically says there is an uneven sharing of those electrons between this species. Uh, one, because this one has more electrons to begin with, but also because this bond isn't shared evenly between these species. And so if you have two atoms that are the same, those electrons are shared evenly. If those two atoms are not the same, they are not going to be shared equally. And so the thing that dictates whether they're sharing equally or not equally is going to be dictated by the electronegativity of the atoms. And so electronegativity is, uh, you can see the formal definition here, a measure of the tendency of atoms to attract electrons. And so we have various different systems for describing electronegativity. The Pauling scale is probably the most commonly used. It basically puts a number on electronegativity. And so you can see a trend on the periodic table. Uh, electronegativity increases as you go this way, and it decreases as you go this way. And so you can see here fluorine is the most electronegative atom. Go down here to francium, uh, and that's the least electronegative electronegative. And so you can see there's numbers associated with these. Fluorine is 4, oxygen 3.5, hydrogen is 2.1, carbon is 2.5. Uh, you'll note that noble gases are not included, mostly because those don't form bonds under normal conditions, and so we ignore those for the most part. But the general idea, again, your most electronegative stuff is up here, your least electronegative is going to be down here. And so when we put those atoms together, what we care about is an electronegativity difference. And so this delta En, delta e usually means a difference between two things. And so you take atoms A and B, you put them together, and you get a delta electronegativity, which is the difference in electronegativity between the two atoms. And so basically this number dictates what kind of bond is being formed. And so if that difference is less than 0.4, it's covalent. If it's 0.4 to 1.8, it's polar covalent, where it's, it's sharing still, but it's not sharing evenly. And then anything greater than 1.8, chances are it's going to be ionic, where it's very unevenly distributed. And so just to show you a cartoonish depiction of that, uh, if the electronegativity difference is sufficiently large, B is a very electronegative, A is less electronegative, B is going to steal that electron, be negatively charged, A will be positively charged. On the other extreme, you have a covalent bond, a pure covalent bond, where there's not really a big electronegativity difference between the two, and it's largely sharing electrons between the two. And then somewhere in between, you have something called polar covalent, where they're still sharing electrons. It's not just stealing it entirely and making a charged species, but it's giving it uh, more to one atom than the other. And so you see this uh, lowercase delta that's basically saying this is partial negative, this is partial positive positive, this is more electronegative, it's stealing that electron density away from A. And note, these are this is just a general rule. This isn't universally true. These are blurry lines. These are somewhat arbitrary. But generally, the less the electronegativity difference, the more covalent it is, the more extreme is ionic, and somewhere in between is polar covalent. And so here's just some examples if you actually want to do the math. Carbon-carbon bond, both same electronegativity, delta En is zero, completely nonpolar. Other extreme, silicon oxygen, that's a 1.6 seven difference. And so that's a polar covalent bond starting to approach like an ionic type threshold. And you can see in between a CH bond 0.4, it's kind of on the boundary between those. Generally, we describe that as nonpolar, but technically it does have an electronegativity difference and it does have a polarity associated with it. And so we can figure out that delta En and we can think about the nature of that bond. And so uh, other nomenclature we use to describe this is this is a polar bond and this is a nonpolar bond.
And so that nomenclature is really important when we start talking about intermolecular forces in a little bit. And so, yeah, polar bond, it basically says that it's still a covalent bond, but it's not sharing those electrons equally. And so B is more electronegative, has a partial negative charge, has a partial positive charge. And so what's dictating that this is a polar bond is something called a dipole moment. It's basically, and this dipole moment, it, it comes across in many different fields. It's basically a difference in two electrical charges. And so they're separated by a magnitude and a distance, and that's what gives you a dipole moment. And so here's the formalism describing a dipole moment. So you have this, this um, mu term here, that's the dipole moment is equal to Q times R. R is the distance, Q is the magnitude of the partial charges. And so uh, you can look up that number. Um, they're, they're, it's in units of Debye, which is right here. And basically you're, you're describing, okay, how far apart are these, which is R, and what's the charge difference between those? And that's the uh, partial negative and the partial positive here. And that dictates how big the dipole moment is. And so if your charge is big or your R is big, that's going to increase your dipole moment. If charge is small and distance is small, then it's going to decrease your dipole moment and vice versa, right? You can um, see how these variables relate. They're directly proportional. If this goes up, this goes up. If this increases, this increases and vice versa. And so one thing to note about dipole moments is it's a vector, right? It has directionality. It's not just a number, it's a number plus a direction associated with it. And so we draw an arrow going from here to here because that's the direction that the electrons are flowing. And so this is pretty common nomenclature or common labeling when describing a dipole moment. You have the arrow going from the positive side, which there's a little plus sign there, going to the negative side, that's the way the electron density is gonna shift. And so again, it's a vector, it has a directionality and it has a magnitude that's uh, describing the dipole moment of a bond. And so looking back at some of our simplest molecules, HF, HBr, HH doesn't have a dipole moment, it's nonpolar, but the rest of these guys have an electronegativity difference. And so for each one of these, we have a direction and we have a magnitude associated with that. And so you can see here, HBr, dipole moment is 0 0.78. Here, HF, you can see 1.92. And so the electronegativity difference is really, really large here. So despite this being shorter, it has a larger dipole moment than HBr does. And so, yeah, you can see the numbers here. The R is uh, 92 picometers, shorter than the HBr bond, which is 142, but you can see the electronegativity difference is 1.9 versus 0 0.7. And so this has a larger dipole moment than this. This is a more polar molecule than this one is. And so again, going back to our original picture, HH, delta electronegativity is zero. There is no polarity difference. There is no charge difference between the two. This has a dipole moment of zero. On the other hand, HF, F is more electronegative by a bunch. Partial negative, partial positive. You can see the vector and the direction associated with it. This is a polar molecule. This is a nonpolar molecule. It basically says this one is neutral distribution of electron clouds. This one gives this side partial negative and that side partial positive. And so these are, these are simple examples, right? Because they're only two atom system. And basically the rule is if the two atoms are the same, it's nonpolar. If the two atoms are different, it's gonna have polar. The degree of polarity will depend on the distance and the charge difference between the two. But what happens when we start getting to more complex systems, like more than two atoms, when we have three, four, we start talking about shapes and we talk about a bunch of different vectors and how those sum together. And so we need to know all those bond polarities to figure out molecular polarities. And so looking at systems that have more than two atoms, we're again, we're gonna use the same nomenclature. We're gonna say nonpolar and polar. Nonpolar says that uh, the dipole moments for all the bonds are either zero or they cancel out. For a polar molecule, the dipole moments don't cancel out. And so overall, the molecule has polarity. So let's see what that means in a second. And something important to note is that even if a molecule has polar bonds, right, it could have, you know, CF bonds. But if those CF bonds cancel each other out, then the molecule overall can be nonpolar. It can have an overall dipole moment of zero. And so let's look at a couple examples of this. Remember, if it doesn't have a molecular dipole or a summed dipole moment across all bonds, it's nonpolar. If it does have a summed dipole moment over the entire molecule, then it's a polar molecule. And so we talked about HCl, two different atoms, different electronegativities, it's gonna have a dipole moment. And so it has a bond dipole, the bond makes up the entire molecule, so this has a molecular dipole. 
Looking at something like BCL3, now each individual boron chlorine bond, this is more electronegative than this. We draw a vector, that's the positive side, that's the negative side. This has a bond dipole. So does this, so does this. This is a trigonal planar molecule because it has three electron clouds associated with it. But when you take all these vectors and add them together, they all cancel out. You can think about this as a tug of war where each one of these is pulling equally. They don't pull any more than the other ones. Each one of these vectors, if you add them together, basically cancels out. So this doesn't have a molecular dipole. And so you add these together, the answer is essentially zero. And so this is a nonpolar molecule. So it has polar bonds, it has three polar bonds, but because they cancel out, this is a nonpolar molecule. Look at something like this, another trigonal planar example where we have H, C, H, and then an O on top here. Uh, carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen. Dipole moment, dipole moment, oxygen, much more an electronegative than carbon. A dipole moment this direction. So unlike this molecule where all three arrows cancel out, this one, these arrows add together, so you can think about them summatively, they're pulling this direction much more than any other direction. And so each bond dipole adds together to give you a molecular dipole. And so while this molecule is nonpolar, this molecule is polar, and you, if you were going to draw the cloud, you'd draw a partial negative over here and a partial positive over here. So overall, the molecule has partial charge associated with it. Taking something like carbon tetrachloride, a uh, dangerous molecule will give you cancer, but it's also a nonpolar molecule. So despite chlorine carbon, there's an electronegative negativity difference. Chlorine is more negative than carbon. Bond dipole, bond dipole, bond dipole, bond dipole, but it's a tetrahedral molecule. And so geometrically, if you're pulling every single direction from the center, all these vectors cancel out, and your vector addition math says there's no overall vector. And so this is a nonpolar molecule. If instead you replace one of those chlorines with hydrogen, hydrogen to carbon, carbon is more electronegative, you have an arrow down, arrow down, arrow down, arrow down, you add all those together, you get an overall dipole moment going down. And so you have partial negative down here, partial positive over here, chloroform is a polar molecule. And so as we'll see later, this dictates the type of intermolecular forces, it dictates what things will dissolve in other things. Uh, carbon tetrachloride and BCl3, these are, are miscible with each other, they're going to be soluble because they're both non polar, it's going to be less soluble when you try to put a nonpolar with a polar. Final example, um, PF5, you have five fluorines around a, a phosphorus, and this one it's a little bit hard to see, but each bond dipole adds up. These three in plane cancel each other out. These two up and down cancel each out. This is a nonpolar molecule. So again, it has polar bonds, but it's an overall nonpolar molecule. And so one thing to note is that, again, the nature of the atoms dictates the polarity and the direction associated with it. And this is just kind of an interesting example. If you compare NH3 to NF3, uh, N is more electronegative than H. That means the vectors are going this way from the H to the N. And you also have a lone pair, which you can draw that essentially going that direction because it's just simpler that way. But when you sum all those together, you get an overall dipole moment of 1.46 to bi going in this direction. And so if you were to watch the electron cloud and put but weights associated with it, you'd see this red region is electron rich, this blue region is electron poor. Now if you replace each of those H's with an F, F is more electronegative than nitrogen, the vectors go that way, that way, that way, you have a cloud pulling against those, but if you add these vectors together, the magnitude and the direction, you get a dipole moment that actually goes down. And so you can see in this case the red cloud's at the bottom, and then it's much lighter colored at the top, and so the vector actually goes this way. And so uh, you're not expected to do this vector math. Uh, the, the main point here is that it's emphasizing that sometimes it's really hard to like define how big the dipole moment is as well as um, uh, how strong it is. Uh, but you can tell both cases they're a polar molecule because in neither of these cases do these vectors cancel out. And so while you may not be able to numerically identify how big that dipole moment is by looking at it, you can start to see trends. You can say, here's the direction it should be, and here's roughly how big it might be if it's fluorine versus hydrogen. And so yeah, there's the summer if you want to take a look at it. Take home messages, there's electronegativity difference between atoms, that dictates whether there's a bond dipole, and if you take all those bond dipoles together, you can figure out if there's an overall molecular dipole moment. And if those dipoles cancel out, it's nonpolar. If, uh, if they don't cancel out, then it's a polar molecule, and that'll dictate how things interact.
So yeah, there's our summary. We went from molecular formulas to Lewis dot structures to VSEPR getting three-dimensional space and then ultimately predicting molecular polarity. And so this is our precursor to using um, the structure to decide whether things will be polar or nonpolar and whether they'll mix, whether they'll be miscible, what the endomolecular forces associated with those molecules will be. And so yeah, that closes out our review of chapter seven. We went through Lewis symbols, the structure via VSEPR, and then we started talking about polarity of molecules. Next, we'll start diving into intermolecular forces.